everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and I've been a big fan of the Raspberry Pi, which is a $35 computer on a circuit board uh, that all you need to do is add your own monitor, keyboard, and mouse, and you are up and running. There's a huge community that's out there supporting this, and there's just so many amazing projects and things that you can do with this. Great for kids, too, uh, who want to learn how to program a computer. But uh, last week, the folks from Element 14 reached out to me to say that there's a new Raspberry Pi, and it's called the B+, and this is it here and uh, they wanted me to check it out. So I said, absolutely, send it on to the show. So let me show you what is different about the B Plus over the B. Now, both of these are running uh, the same processor. They're both uh, uh, running this Broadcom system on a chip, a BCM2835. They both have 512 megs of RAM. However, this one uses less power. So um, it's about a, a watt of power less, a 0.5 to one watt less power. And what they've been able to do with that uh, power savings is give you more USB ports built in. So what happened with the old one was that uh, you plug in a keyboard and a mouse, and then if you wanted to do Wi-Fi, you were kind of stuck unless you hooked up more stuff like a USB hub or something like that. Uh, so what they've been able to do here is allow you to use four USB devices simultaneously. Now, you don't want to have anything that draws a lot of power like a hard drive, but um, you know a memory stick, keyboard, mouse, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth cards, all those things should work uh, just fine in one of these four USB ports. Um, like the old version, it also has Ethernet on board. What they have done, though, is consolidated a few other ports on the side here as well. So you'll see uh, the old one had a separate port for composite video and for audio. Uh, this one consolidates everything into a, a single connector. You still have the HDMI as well for uh, sending video and audio out to the device. Another big change is the GPIO pins on here. Now, what these pins do uh, is let you hook up devices to uh, interact with your programs. And there's a full implementation of Python on here that a lot of people are using to uh, connect to sensors, game controllers, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so you can kind of go beyond just USB and actually make your own devices that uh, connect up with these, uh, these pins on the top. And they give you a lot more. I think it's uh, tw uh, 40 versus 26 pins. So if you can uh, imagine a project now, you can probably uh, do something with that. The other major change is on the bottom where the old one used a uh, SD card, a full-size SD card. This new one uh, uses just a micro SD card. So that's, uh, that's it. Uh, Performance-wise, it's the same. Uh, it's all the same hardware for the most part. So if you have an image that you're running on a current Raspberry Pi, it'll work on this one just the same. They're almost completely interchangeable, uh, minus, of course, the fact that the SD card sizes have changed a little bit. But you can get an adapter uh, to make everything work. So um, I'm going to boot this up because the last couple of Raspberry Pi videos I did were on the multimedia capabilities. So if you go back and look at some of my prior videos, I have it running off of my uh, HD home run. So with, with this video, I'm actually going to go in and kind of show you some stuff. We're going to take a look at some retro video games and we'll see, uh, you know, just a little uh, tour of its uh, graphical user interface uh, that comes with the Raspbian OS. So let's uh, get this hooked up and boot it up. Now to boot up the Raspberry Pi, all you need to do is connect some micro USB power to it. Um, I have it running off of a, a charger for one of my tablets. So it's a two amp uh, connection, which should be just fine. Um, the, the Raspberry Pi will draw about 1.8 amps at, at its maximum. So if you have like a, a smartphone charger, that may not be enough. You probably want to have something uh, that will at least deliver 1.8 amps. And if you use like an iPad charger or something, that should be uh, just fine there. But that's it. It's all it needs is about uh, you know, 1.8 amps of uh, USB power, and it goes. Now, what we're running here is something called the RetroPie project. And uh, this is a uh, just an image that you can download, an SD card image you can download from uh, their website, and it basically becomes like a little retro gaming station. It is a bit to configure, so I've done a little bit of uh, pre-configuration just to make it a little bit qu uh, quicker here to get everything up and running. But uh, we'll let this boot up here for a second, and you'll just see uh, what they've done with this. What's nice is that this boots like right up to this uh, front-end menu that you can control with your game controller. Now, I have a wired USB controller plugged in right now, but if you have a Bluetooth dongle and there's a bunch of them available that you can plug into the USB port, uh, you could use a wireless controller. It supports PlayStation 3 controllers, Wii controllers, you name it. Uh, it'll probably work on here. You can even uh, do some hardware configuration with those GPIO pins and connect uh, say, uh, Super Nintendo and Nintendo controllers to it as well, and they have specs for uh, designing that hardware yourself. So really cool stuff. So this is the menu that uh, you get when it boots up. A really nice menu here. This has actually come a long way since I first started playing with it. And you can kind of you know, dig into a system and then uh, select the game that you want to play, and it will then pop out to an emulator and boot that game right up. So uh, really nice. The gameplay feels really good. Now, this is a Nintendo, which is a, you know, a 6502 processor, so not uh, the fastest thing in the world. But it's certainly cool that uh, it runs at absolutely full speed here on uh, the Raspberry Pi. So we'll just pop into this game real quick, and you can just see how 
how it looks. It looks very close to the original, so uh, pretty cool there. But you can do some other stuff too, which is uh, actually run uh, PlayStation games on here as well. So I think the PlayStation 1 is probably the limit to uh, what it's capable of doing, but I, I have been impressed actually with just how well uh, it was able to do that. So let's boot up uh, Destruction Derby 2, one of my favorite games from the PlayStation, and see how it runs on here. All right, here we are with Destruction Derby 2. It loads up actually quite nicely here. So we'll let it uh, get to its main menu. I'm just going to pop into a race really quick so you can just see how, uh, how it performs with its uh, 3D rendering. And, you know, retro gaming is a tough thing for any system to do, especially, you know, things like the PlayStation, which, uh, you know, it's, it's ha it has to emulate all the processors, basically translate all of those uh, instructions into its native instruction set. Uh, and actually run the game at a decent frame rate, including all the 3D effects and everything. And it seems to be doing pretty well. Now, granted, the PlayStation is a 20-year-old system, but I don't even think you can buy a PlayStation used for 35 bucks these days. Uh, so um, it's a pretty good deal, uh, considering the fact that we're running this on a really uh, low-powered computer, but are able to get a pretty playable game. It's not you know, completely 100% smooth, but it's, it's certainly playable. And I think this is probably about the limit as to what you can emulate on here, but it gives you an idea of what... Uh, its overall capabilities are. Now it is more than games, of course. It has a fully functional graphical user interface. I can even install Chrome on here so I can sync it up with uh, all of my other Google stuff. Um, it's not the fastest thing in the world, especially in its graphical mode, but uh, it is more than capable. And a lot of times when you're using it, you're, you have to you know, remind yourself that this is a little tiny computer that's $35. It only has 512 megs of RAM, but it's uh, fully, fully capable. So um, I think it's great for a, a whole host of different uses, especially for high Obvious. If you're, you know, want to start experimenting with programming and maybe controlling robotics or, you know, temperature sensors or cameras, uh, there's a lot that you can really start playing around with on here, and a huge community uh, to support what you're looking to do. So if you've got kids and you want to, you know, get them to see the the, the things that you saw on computers at an early age, I think this is really the best. Uh, thing you can get for them to really start to play around with it because it is you know somewhat limited by its hardware and you have to learn how to really uh, work around those limitations which can result in some really creative programming so I've been a big fan of it I think the B plus is a great improvement um, we'll have to wait to see uh, you know some of those uh, enclosures the cases that you can get for it will have to get updated but uh, having the four USB ports on board uh, makes a big difference and its power management you know the fact that it uses less power is good for those of you that are running them off of solar panels or batteries and really uh, want to get as much as you can out of it uh, with the least amount of power possible. So uh, that is the Raspberry Pi B Plus, and this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.